good morning or good afternoon from wherever you might be joining. My name is Ellen von Hutem of the IMAP in Japanese Humanities at Kyushu University. And I would like to welcome you to this first talk in our reiterations of the past series. This series is actually part of a three year project grant obtained by myself and my colleague, Caleb Carter. And in this project, we investigate objects, practices, and places that exemplify interactions with the past issuing from the uh, point of view that the past has continuously been reconstructed from some present. We try to not limit ourselves to Japan. And in fact, we had one earlier lecture, uh, which was delivered by Professor Frank Coram of Boston University, in which he took us through his experience doing field work during the Hosei ceremony in Trinidad. Today, however, we're going to shift our focus to Japan again. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Simpson of Dartmouth College and Professor Abe Ryuichi from Harvard University, who are going to deliver us a lecture and a discussion on Toyohime and Dragon Princesses. Without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Simpson to give her lecture. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. and everyone at QDI and at the IMAP program for um, inviting me to give this particular talk, as well as to my discussant, Ryuichi Abe, for joining me today. It's really an honor to be here, and uh, this is by far the biggest talk I've ever given, so I'm really looking forward to uh, your questions and comments afterwards as well. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, is that looking good for everyone? Okay, great. The Empress's new sister, the role of Toyohime in medieval legends of Empress Jingu. Um, as those of you who might be familiar with my work or have heard me give a talk before know, uh, my primary work is on Empress Jingu. So let me introduce her to you. Uh, Jingu is, uh, her traditional uh, reign, her traditional years are um, 169 to 269. So living in the third and fourth centuries, whether or not she she actually lived is um, open to debate and not a question we can really answer, um, but she's said to have reigned for 69 of those years after her legendary conquest of the Korean Peninsula for which she is best known. Um, and so this conquest was uh, not only ordained by the kami, but also facilitated by them. So her ability to communicate with the kami was really key to this story, which first appears in the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki. Um, another significant part of her story is that she gives birth to Emperor Ojin. In fact, she's um, hugely pregnant for most of the conquest and decides to postpone uh, childbirth until after the conquest so that she gives birth to Ojin in Japan. So it, for, the story first appears in the 8th century chronicles, but it really um, develops into a whole new story in the medieval period, and that's one of the things I'll focus on today. So considering some of the changes that we see in Empress Jingu's legend in the late medieval period, uh, here are some of the key ones that again are relevant to our treatment here. First of all, the conquest was reframed as a preemptive strike against the depraved Korean kingdoms. In uh, many of the texts you see uh, sort of direct criticisms of the Korean kingdoms as uh, greedy, as trying to conquer Japan. And it's worth remembering that this is the late medieval period, so it's after the Mongol invasions of Japan. And partially because of that, we also see a sort of change in the deities that appear and aid Jingu in her quest. For instance, sea deities are given a much larger role, as is the case with Sumiyoshi, who appears in the original narratives, notably in the Nihon Shoki, but uh, has a much larger role in medieval narratives of Empress Jingu as um, sort of her uh, chief of staff, her um, you know, general and, and commander in chief. Um, and we also see new sea, de sea deities uh, brought into the story, again, notably Azumi no Isora, I'll be talking about a good bit today, who is not in the original legends, but comes to be part of a lot of the Hachiman stories of the medieval period. You also see a new motif in terms of two tide controlling jewels, one sort of the full tide and the other the low tide jewel being instrumental in making the conquest actually happen. Um, again, there's a slight reference to this in the Nihon Shoki when um, Empress Jingu is supposed to get a Nioi pearl, uh, but in terms of the you know, actual 
um, use of the jewels to, uh, you know, basically drown the Korean army. That's something we start seeing in the medieval period. And finally, uh, the focus of my talk today, uh, Empress Jinggu acquires a new younger sister named Toyohime. So here she is, Toyohime, um, pictured in one of the sev seven scrolls in the Hachiman Digital Hand Scroll Project, um, which is great fun. I, I use it as often as possible, um, also because it's very timely. Again, it's uh, mostly uh, hand scrolls from the late medieval period. However, I'll start by talking about Toyohime in the Hachiman Gudokun. Uh, this text from the beginning of the 14th century um, has sort of the most vibrant Empress Jingu legend that we have, and that's equally true for Toyohime. It's sort of the richest in how Toyohime is presented. So I'm going to go through a number of quotes from the Hachiman Gudokun, as well as discuss her different roles in that text. So she's first introduced as the Empress's younger sister and as being beautiful as the signs of the Tathagata and that her looks are without peer in this world. So even though dragons are beasts in forms, how could this woman not convince them? So she's introduced at the moment that Sumiyoshi is advising Empress Jingu that she needs to go get the tide controlling jewels if she wants to um, actually affect the conquest in Korea, and they're debating who to send. And in this case, um, Toyohime is presented as the natural choice, as the younger sister, as being beautiful. Uh, she's sort of a surefire bet in order to convince the dragon king. So after this moment, Empress Jinggu uh, speaks to her younger sister, sort of explaining why this needs to happen. And it's a relatively long speech that goes into the death of Empress Jinggu's husband, Emperor Chuai, her grief for him, her desire to carry on his, uh, you know, desired conquest, uh, the fact that she is pregnant with the next heir to the throne. And then finally, she gives Toyohime concrete instructions in terms of, you have to arrive at the palace of the Dragon King, borrow the jewels. Um, this these jewels will definitely, uh, you know, make the conquest happen. And finally, in order to secure these jewels, we promise the Dragon King Shagara that uh, the child residing in her room, the future crown prince, will become his son-in-law. And thus, another Dragon King's daughter is sort of brought into the imperial family. So in this, uh, so in these instructions to Toyohime, she definitely has the role as a messenger. And that's, these are two patterns that we see continued as uh, Toyohime kind of embarks on her journey. She first, uh, you know, listens to her sister and, you know, sheds tears in acknowledgement of, uh, you know, what she has to do. Um, you'll see in some of the language here, uh, she wraps herself in a rain of pear blossoms, no different from embracing the dew of red flowers. Both uh, this language and that of Jinga's speech is drawing from the Song of Everlasting Sorrow, the very well-known poem by Bo Juyi. And then finally, once she goes to um, the palace of the dragon king, she follows the royal order, of course, and then describes in detail the meaning of what Empress Jingu's um, saying to dragon king Shagara, who, of course, grants the jewels. So she is very successful very quickly. And she's escorted by two kami, one of them, Azumi no uh, Isora, who I'll talk about shortly. And in three days, they return. Uh, but in talking about her return with the jewels, it is also mentioned that Toyohime is in fact a kami. She is the Kawakami Dai Myojin. So this is where we see her as a deity as well. And this is reiterated in the final passage on Toyohime, where she is referred to not only as Kawakami Dai Myojin, but also as the Homan Bodhisattva, the um, essentially Bodhisattva full of jewels. So again, you see that connection um, with the jewels in question, um, reiterating that she's the Empress's younger sister and that like the Empress, um, she has the body of the woman, but she girds herself for battle. This again follows a very vibrant scene in which Empress Jingu's armor and and you know, readiness for battle is described. So finally, she's here as sister, deity, and warrior. So again, in the Gudokun, uh, Toyohime fulfills a number of different roles, and some of which we'll see repeated in other texts. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Toyohime in visual culture, uh, arguably the earliest um, instance in which we see Toyohime, Toyohime actually depicted is in the Shikaumi Jinja Engi E, which consists of two hanging scrolls, both of which detail the legend of Jingu, which is somewhat rare. 
Um, these are also 14th century, although we don't know exactly when. And in these scrolls, Toyohime is depicted holding the two tide controlling jewels and emerging from the sea, not in a boat or anything, but sort of bringing them out of the sea clearly. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture, or, or rather the only picture I have is a um, pretty poor scan of um, Haruko Wakabayashi's fabulous article on this piece. So um, unfortunately, I can't show you that, but I'll be showing you um, some images from the Hachiman Digital Hand Scroll Project. So this is again a wonderful project spearheaded by Melanie Treda at uh, Heidelberg University. Um, and if you've not ever checked it out, I encourage you to do so. Um, but basically in terms of Toyohime, we find that she's depicted in three out of the seven scrolls, but she's only mentioned in one of them. Um, the Berlin scroll, which is technically the oldest, the, the newest scroll of the, um, of the project, but it's actually based on relatively early scrolls um, that were made at Konda Hachiman Shrine. So just to talk a little bit about what goes on in the, um, uh, you know, a depiction of Toyohime in the Berlin Scroll. Um, again, we have uh, Sumiyoshi initiating this uh, quest to get the jewels, which will therefore secure the conquest. And so first off, um, Sumiyoshi mentions the boy Isora here, here and in many of the uh, scrolls he's described as a young boy. He's a guide to the seed, but we need an attendant to accompany him. The Empress agrees, and then again it's decided that Toyohime is the most fitting person to act as messenger and request the jewels. Thereupon Isoro took Toyohime with him and headed to the palace where, of course, they um, borrowed the jewels. This time they return early in the morning on the following day, a little sooner than the Gudokun, and thus the Empress was particularly impressed. Um, so here we see, you know, sort of a shorter version of what we saw in the Gudokun, and Toyohime is still sort of considered the messenger, but there's also language with about Isora taking Toyohime with him, so it's a little bit more ambiguous how um, firm her role is. Another thing that we see, particularly in the Hachiman Digital Hand Scroll Project, is um, an idea that perhaps Isora and Toyohimi might be somewhat conflated or at least um, paired in a particular way. Um, so here I show the um, one scroll in which both of them are depicted, the Hakosaki Hachiman uh, Shrine. Uh, scroll and there you see that um, Toyohime is on the left sort of holding the two jewels on a platform uh, whereas Isora is depicted on the right dancing on the stage and we know it's Isora because he has the white covering over his face. Um, he has that white covering because he had been living at the bottom of the ocean and barnacles had covered his face so he considers himself very unsightly all of which is detailed in the Gudokun but it's also seen as the origins of the Seino dance a particular form of no with a white face covering. So here they're depicted together, but in most cases, in um, many of the other scrolls, one or the other is depicted. And you can see here how their depiction is relatively similar. Um, these are two scrolls created not too far apart temporally, at least. We see a very similar dragon boat. Uh, we see them both them holding the jewels not on a platform as Toyohime was before, but sort of growing out of a plant. The jewels look very similar. Uh, really, the only thing that's different is the depiction of the actual person in question, right? Um, Toyohime has sort of more feminine hair and clothing, um, but Isura is depicted as sort of a young boy. So um, what we might imagine here is that, especially in the case of these emaki, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, they're um, usually a combination of text and images, right? And so in order to get more of the story into the images, it's possible that they were kind of both seem to be equivalent in this particular scene. But looking at some other texts, we do see both of them mentioned. And again, the sort of role each of them play can shift a bit. Um, for instance, in the Rokugo Kaizan Nimon Dai Bosatsu Hongi, which is also a Muromachi period text, again, we don't know exactly when, uh, Toyohime is actually not named Toyohime, but she's the younger sister of the imperial consort, who is definitely Jingu, um, and she is called the Shikanoshima Daimyojin, which I'll get to in a minute. She was chosen as the divination specialist, a term, um, uh, the Chinese term is feng shi, and that's um, what uh, Alan Grappard uses in his article on this particular text. Um, 
And so the divinity Isora is appointed as her attendant. So you would think, again, maybe a little bit lower. Um, upon their arrival, the imperial request was delivered and, you know, the same promise given that uh, Emperor Ojin will marry the Dragon King's daughter. The Empress obtains the two precious jewels and um, uh, subjugated the Korean peninsula. And that's really all this text actually says about the conquest itself. So again, this is a Muromachi period text, but one thing that's interesting is that Shika no Shima Daimyojin is usually Isora, not uh, Toyohime. So we see some sort of flexibility there. It's also interesting that Toyohime is considered a divination specialist. This would seem to sort of reflect her uh, relationship with Jingu, whose sort of original role before the conquest was as court shaman uh, to her husband, Emperor Chuai, right? She's the one who communicates with the gods and finds out what's supposed to happen. Um, so we might see some sibling affinity there. And finally, I think it's worth noting that the Kunisaki Peninsula, on which the um, uh, Rokugo uh, complex is, is based, has a deep relationship with the Lotus Sutra. Um, like some other mountains in Japan, the Lotus Sutra was essentially mapped onto this particular mountain. And so you find that there are 28 temples that are directly correlated with 28 chapters from the Lotus Sutra, which sort of brings us into other associations and why Toyohime emerges at this time. I'd just like to mention a couple other texts that we see again in the Muromachi period um, that describe Toyohime very briefly, but in slightly different ways. Um, for instance, in the Munakata Daibosatsu Goengi, um, written in the Namboku period, um, it's just mentioned that the honored younger sister Toyohime, now Kawakami Daimyojin, that um, Kawakami Daimyojin is written in small characters, uh, came down to the Dragon Palace. So um, this is a text that also mentions Isora, but again, very briefly. In the Hachimangu Engi, uh, written with this one we know actually a year, 1435, um, Toyohime accompanies Asumi no Isodo, again, essentially Isora, um, of Shikanoshima. Here, Isora is identified as Shikanoshima to the Dragon King's Palace. And then finally, in the Hachiman Guji Jun Paiki, also a very well known Hachiman text that uh, sort of led to uh, proliferation in other texts, um, the Kawakami deity is mentioned, but not the name Toyohime. So we can see here that there are a bunch of different appellations, and again, there's clearly some affinity with Isora, but it's not like they're necessarily doubles of each other either. I also want to briefly mention the um, Jingu sisters as they're presented in the Heike, I should say a particular version of the Heike, the um, Nagatobon version, um, because it's really interesting what is said here, and it's basically a small... Um, section talking about Itsukushima, who is, of course, the tutelary deity of the Taira, and saying that she is younger sister to Empress Jingu and the Dragon King's daughter, um, and an older sister to Toyohime. So now we have more sisters for Jingu, right? Not just Toyohime, but really connecting her all the more deeply um, with the Dragon King's daughter story, with the sea, um, and with Itsukushima. So here again is where we might consider whether um, the various debates about the Dragon King's daughter, what this meant for women's enlightenment, somewhat influenced these Hachiman scrolls. Um, and again, not all of them are Hachiman. One of this uh, texts I mentioned before is from the Munakata shrine complex. But another possible idea is that the, there's some influence from the luck of the sea, luck of the mountain myth, which again is, is in the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki. Um, and just to briefly recap this for those of you who may not be familiar, um, there's a god named Hori who um, is actually a hunter but borrowed his brother's fish hook and then lost it. And so he goes to the sea to find it and ends up at the um, Dragon King's palace at the bottom of the sea and becomes acquainted with the Dragon King's daughter, Toyotama Bime, whom he marries. But after a few years, he wants to return to land. So Toyotama Hime returns with him um, and gives birth to their first child child. Um, but while she's giving birth, she tells him not to look at her. Of course, he does look at her and finds out that she's actually a wani, um, now usually translated as crocodile, but in this case, more like a dragon or certain kind of sea creature, right? And then so she uh, flees back to the Dragon King's palace and sends her sister, Tamayori Bime, up to uh, raise the child. And this child um, is eventually marries Tamayori Bime and um, 
gives birth to Emperor Jimmu, the first human emperor in the Japanese imperial line. So, so it's another very important story, and we can see some clear correlations between Tamayori Bime and Toyohime, right? We see a journey from either the sea palace to the land or vice versa in the case of Toyohime. Uh, we see the importance of jewels for Tamayori Bime. The jewel is directly in her name, and if we think about her sister Toyotama, uh, Bime, we, also, we have both the Tama and then the Toyo that we see in Toyohime. And of course, Toyohime, one of her key roles is to seek the tide controlling jewels. Also, both are sent by their sisters to do something important. Um, so Tamayori Bime is sent by her sister to care for the, the child her sister left behind. Um, Toyohime is sent by her sister to both secure the jewels, but also negotiate her nephew's marriage. So there you see a connection with, you know, sort of the continuation of the line and specifically the imperial line, right? In the case of Tamayori Bime, you have, um, you know, she's the mother of Emperor Jimu, the ancestor of the imperial line pretty important. And then uh, Toyohime is still facilitating the continuation of the imperial line, both in terms of protecting Japan and then finding um, a wife for um, her future nephew. So finally, just to put this in a little further context and some sort of broader trends that are going on, within the Hachiman cult, we see um, Tamayori Bime as a component of the Hachiman triad. This is most notably true at Usa, which is one of the three great Hachiman shrines and quite possibly the earliest. Um, so one of the other projects I'm working on is how the um, deities in general, but specifically the Hachiman uh, deity, the Hachiman triad is sort of flexible and changes from shrine to shrine. Uh, you do see a fair amount of Tamayori Bime as one of the three components um, in quite a lot of shrines, particularly in Kyushu. You also see in a lot of, particularly in a lot of the Hachiman Engi, you do see Azumi no Isora as an important character. And he's obviously a singular male deity, but that wasn't always the case. Um, originally, there were three Watatsumi deities, which are affiliated with the sea and are often thought to be um, sort of the dragons at the bottom of the sea. Uh, but during the medieval period, uh, Isora was sort of, re or Watasumi was reconceived as Isora as a singular male deity that uh, played particularly well in these Engi and these, you know, stories that were quite important. You also see a growth in iconography of dragons and sea turtles, both in terms of the dragon uh, boats that, you, that are ridden by either Toyohime or Isora in the uh, hand scrolls. Uh, there are sea turtles in, for instance, the Gudokun and other tales that sort of, again, emphasize this connection with the sea in sort of a really vibrant way. And finally, I just like to the point to the overall importance of Chusei Shinwa or medieval myths. These are myths largely taken from the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki that get sort of retold and reimagined during the medieval period, um, specifically with sort of the continent in mind. And it's again important to remember that this is after the Mongol invasions. Hachiman is particularly known for his role as a sort of war deity and protector of Japan, thought to have sent the kamikaze or divine winds that repelled the Mongol invasions, but other sea deities were thought of as being important, and you see their role in sort of the defense of Japan uh, sort of um, projected backward to the period in which um, Jingu was supposed to be uh, conquering the Korean peninsula. So I think I will leave it there and turn it over to uh, Professor Abe for uh, comments. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. Thank you very much for your talk. Professor Abe, will you try sharing the screen yourself? Let me unmute you. Seems you are still muted as well. So Evan, I'm am I one of the co-hosts? Um, you should be. Let me. Ch yes, I made you one of co the co-hosts. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, okay I will disappear yes. in the background again. <laughs> ah, so thank you very much. Uh, Emily, for your wonderful presentation. It was so inspiring. I thoroughly enjoyed. 
And my thanks to Ellen and Caleb and uh, everyone else who organized uh, this wonderful event. I'm already very much enjoying. So um, I thought there are three major issues uh, Emily raised and uh, these are my personal takeaways. So I would like to go, uh, go over the three points. So first is the, the legend of seeking jewel in the underwater realm or tamatori densetsu in Japanese. And I thought Emily's take on this uh, really helps us understand what medieval Japanese mythologies or Chusei Nihongi are and about. And the second one is the importance of Kagura, uh, which um, I think I read uh, Emily's paper, so her paper version uh, emphasized this too, but Essentially, I thought the role of the ritual performance in reconstructing mythology is an important one. And I thought she did a wonderful job pointing out that, that too. And the third one, which I thought was most fascinating is Emily's take on the relationship between Toyohime and Isora. And she used the word conflation, but um, what caused their conflation and what's behind this you know, interesting conflation. So let me move on. So first about uh, the jewel seeking legend. And I un identified two major sources for the medieval version of the jewel seeking legend. The first one is obviously ancient Japanese myth. And uh, as Emily pointed out, the uh, umisachi or lack of the sea story in Kojiki and Nihongi, um, that is one major source. But uh, there is also a very interesting uh, parallel development in Buddhist sutras. So in many scriptures like the Lotus or the Golden Light Sutra, uh, there are stories of Bodhisattva, uh, there are <laughs> stories of a Bodhisattva, very brave, and uh, uh, really interested in helping uh, out uh, impoverished and, and the suffering beings. So he goes into the, uh, the Dragon King's palace together with impoverished beings and ordinary beings um, seek for all the treasures, gold, silver, and precious uh, jewels, but he only goes for wish granting jewel. And when he returns with wish granting jewel, he presents it to the king and, uh, uh, and enshrine that atop the king's palace. And then the reign of the treasures, <laughs> together with the reign of the Dharma, uh, fall all over the land and that benefits all beings. So that sort of uh, story is told in the, the older translation of the Lotus Sutra in Dharmaraksha's, uh, I mean Dharmaraksha's older translation and also Golden Light Sutra. Um, and in that sense, um, I think probably I mean, if I could just expand Emily's point, maybe we can come up with a, a definition of what uh, Chusei Nihongi or medieval uh, Japanese mythologies are and are about. So it's an effort to reread ancient imperial myths in the framework of Buddhist theories, so that the medieval, uh, so, so in such a way that medieval Kemi's authority of the kingship, both emperors and the shoguns could be justified or even you know, fortified. So it is a very high, highly politically motivated operation in that sense. So. Uh, with this kind of angle, I think Emily's point about Toyohime uh, having the form of the Tathagata, complete with uh, Tathagata's 32 uh, auspicious signs, is a critically important uh, reading because it really uh, conflates or even collapses two aspects of Toyohime, one as a ancient Japanese female sea deity and the other as the manifestation of Buddha or Bodhisattva. So I thought, uh, let's see, 
how do I go to okay uh, so I thought just uh, giving one good example uh, of a parallel story with Emily's uh, story about uh, Toyohime uh, is, is useful here. So uh, her story reminded me of Hiko Hohodemi uh, illustrated scrolls. So this was originally sponsored by Emperor Goshirakawa and it relates a story of uh, 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 the, you know, Misachi, or uh, the lack of the sea, uh, the legend, and uh, so I'm I just I'm just showing the scroll three in which uh, Prince Hikohogodemi or Misachi, the lack of the sea, goes to the Dragon King's palace, uh, meets the Dragon Princess, they fall in love with each other, and they live very happily there for. I think three years. So this is the scene at which they are you know, having a wonderful, sharing a wonderful meal and having a great time. So um, in this scroll, Hikoho Hodemi, an imperial ancestor, stands for Goshirakawa you know, because he's, he, he's a former emperor and, and also his authority as imperial uh, uh, the leader. And the dragon princess, stands for Heike clan, for the Heike clan, because that clan worships the dragon princess at Itsukushima, and the clan was known uh, for enjoying their prosperity by the protection of their dragon goddess. So Goshirakawa's intention of making this scroll uh, in 1160s, I believe, uh, it's a, the timing at which many scholars agree, is that while um, he still needs uh, Taira no Kiyomori's and Heike Kuran's support in order to uh, run the affair of the state in Japan, uh, th th his relationship with Kiyomori turns into more intense rival rivalry from time to time. So by producing this, uh, the way in which uh, these two figures fall in love and they are you know, having a great time is a great sign from uh, Goshiroka's point of view that his intention is to maintain peace with uh, Taira no Kiyomori and the clan. So in order to do that, of course, the, the, the inclusion of Buddhist elements, uh, especially the Dragon King, plays a very important uh, role uh, in this visual way of justifying the medieval power alliance between imperial court and the warriors. So let me move on. Oops. So the next, uh, I mean, th this is a later scene in the same, uh, same uh, Hikoho Hodemi scrolls. So actually the dragon princess uh, is now giving, giving birth to Hikoho Hodemi's uh, son uh, Emily talked about this story. Uh, so she goes to the, uh, she, she lands on the Japanese uh, seashore to give birth, uh, but uh, Hikoho Hodemi uh, could not suppress her curiosity, looks into this uh, childbirth scene and sees her in the dragon's form. And having realized that and ashamed, she goes back to her own uh, underwater palace, but sends her younger sister, Tamayori, and uh, Tamayori becomes the, the wet nurse of the child and also later the wife, uh, as Emily already pointed out. So this has a real historical implication because as many of you know, uh, the Goshirakawa's son, uh, Emperor Takaoka, I'm sorry, Emperor Takakura, I made a mistake, and uh, Taira no Kiyomori's daughter, uh, Taira no Noriko, got married. And uh, they gave birth to, you know, the prince who became Emperor Antoku, uh, who became Emperor Antoku in year 1180, 
But as many of you know, at the final bat battle between Genji and Heike at the Danora in 1185, the Antok perished. So that was the end of this peacemaking. But there are lots of interesting parallels between what's going on in the in this picture scroll and the, the relationship between Goshirakawa's court and the Heike. So let me move to the second point. The significance of ritual performance as represented by Kaura dance. So for the medieval interpretation of ancient Japanese mythology to actually work well, I think it's natural uh, narrative elements need to be actually acted out as ritual performances. And uh, the earlier Hachiman Gudokun, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, one of my professors with whom I learned uh, this, uh, this genre, he always used the, uh, the Kinse, the Edo period pronunciation. So he kept saying Hachiman Gudokin, but in the medieval context, I have to say Hachiman Gudokun. So the earlier and the less organized uh, group of uh, Hachiman Gudokun texts, Korui or Kobon, uh, they identify that uh, when um, uh, the Sumiyoshi was assigned the task of uh, dancing and alluring uh, the uh, Isora uh, uh, coming out of the sea for this important mission. Um, so Sumiyoshi was accompanied by four other gods, Suwa, Atsuta, uh, Mishima, and Kora. And, uh, and at the same time, there were eight dancing uh, women uh, who were headed by Homan Daifosatsu. Of course, in our context, uh, this female Bodhisattva is just another name of uh, Toyohime. And so that kind of identification is done in the, in, in the earlier and less organized version of Hachiman Gudokun. But in the, the Otsurui or the later and the more organized version of Hachiman Gudokun, uh, the identification is expanded. So now the five uh, male uh, dancer musicians are identified as five Buddhas of the Diamond Mandala. And eight female dancers led by Homan Daibosatsu are understood as the, the four Buddhas and the four Bodhisattvas of the matri I mean, the center uh, lotus, uh, eight four the lotus uh, petals of the, se uh, the center of the matrix mandar. Um, so um, my point is, uh, so the Kagura dance which is a ded dedicated performance to Hachiman, uh, in this kind of context also serves as a ritual dedication to esoteric Buddhist divinities of these two Mandara realms. So let me move to the, my final point. Uh, and this is my, 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 my comment on Emily's very fascinating point about uh, Toyohime and uh, and Isora being completed. Uh, so I thought in addition to conflation, I also see some kind of conflict. So one is a beautiful young uh, female and the other is a beautiful young man. So as, as you move to the later period, uh, Isora becomes, I think, younger and more beautiful and their uh, pictorial representation looks more and more similar as Emily already pointed out. Um, but why you have these two almost identical uh, representation of two different figures? So I thought about uh, the intentions behind uh, creating these figures who look so similar. And because they are extremely beautiful, um, I think it has something to do with their you know, character as, as being an uh, object of sexual desire. So I thought about who is actually you know, looking at them with sexual desire. 
And uh, this dancing scene of Sumiyoshi <laughs> somehow reminds me of this. So it's, this is a scene of the uh, Chigo, young page boys serving monks or high monks uh, at Daigoji in the cherry blossom festival, during the cherry blossom festivals. So maybe one possible way to think about it is, you know, it might be possible for us to see Torihime as, a repre as representing the interest of imperial court and shoguns. So then the young woman as a shamaness, uh, she, who, who also do the divination, it's a very important a part of the tradition of imperial rituals that goes back all the way to Amaterasu. So that kind of explains why Torohime was introduced. Why you know, this, this female figure suddenly appeared. But then the second hypothesis I was thinking about is uh, as we move on to the later medieval period, uh, she became replaceable with uh, Isura, which is a young male, uh, because uh, the Isura seems to represent the interest of ecclesiastical monks who were you know, controlling uh, Hakozaki, Usa, and uh, Iwashizumi's Hachiman shrines. So all the heads of the shrines are esoteric Buddhist monks. So this kind of justifies the role of monks as a crucial link between the ruler and the Hachiman God. So either hypothesis we take, probably they are not mutually exclusive as well, uh, but one kind of discontent I have is, I mean, my original expectation is while the Torihime was newly introduced, I probably see some kind of, uh, you know, very active voice representing the female Buddhist or Shinto practitioners. But either way, if we continue to read this, uh, we end up with a kind of uh, uh, misogynistic uh, tendencies uh, that you know, we see everywhere in medieval Japanese uh, Hachiman le legend. Uh, but of course, unless, as Emily has done very well, uh, Toyohime is uh, interpreted as representing the really enlightened uh, female bodhisattva, as in the case of uh, Lotus Sutra's Dragon Princess. So let me end here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, Ryuichi. Um, Emily, before we open the floor to general questions, would you like to give a brief response to these comments? Um, Sorry, I was still muted. <laughs> uh, sure, th uh, Ryuichi, thank you so much yes. for such uh, thoughtful and uh, comprehensive uh, comments on um, my talk and some of the things that you um, see within it, certain themes that um, I would also agree with and others that I hadn't really um, considered. I guess uh, the main thing I would want to address is, uh, is this last idea about, um, is it really conflation so much as conflict? And I think you bring up uh, very important points in terms of what Toyohime and Isora represent either to viewers or you know, more importantly in some ways to the creators, right? Um, certainly the possibility of, um, Toyohime and that uh, you're sort of playing a role in Isora's transformation from a very clearly ugly barnacled guy who needs to have his face covered to an object of sexual desire does make us think of Chico, right, in their particular role. And I think that also ties back into what you were saying about Kagura and the key aspect ritual performance plays in within these uh, narratives and within how they were, you know, enacted, as it were. Um, in terms of um, hypothesis A and B, that's definitely something I'd like to consider um, further, certainly in terms of thinking of, um, you know, Toyohime as a young woman who's the shamaness um, enacting imperial rituals. Um, again, with the connection to Kagura, I thought of Amino Uzume as well as a Materasu. Um, and then Isora 
as representing um, the monks in, in some ways, and that would also maybe account for um, how in some texts um, Isora takes full precedence, right? Toyohime is either shunted to the side or not. Um, present at all. So again, he may have been more interesting to monks for a variety of reasons. Um, so in terms of reading Toyohime as an enlightened female bodhisattva, I mean, she's certainly presented as a bodhisattva and so is Jingu at this point, right? This is when um, she starts to be seen as the um, uh, Seibo Bodhisattva or, or the Seibo Dai uh, Bosatsu, uh, the uh, Sacred Mother uh, Bodhisattva. So um, I think that that's there to a certain extent. And, um, and of course, but I admit, of course, it's something I would like to see. Uh, you know, uh, we do, as you were saying, in terms of the medieval period, it's hard to get away from all the misogyny. So it is, um, uh, you know, sometimes, but I think also helpful to show uh, ways in which women were, cons or women figures at least, were considered to be enlightened and able to enact um, certain uh, uh, policies as well as, you know, reach a certain state of enlightenment. One of the things I always go back to in the Gudokun is saying that, you know, that, that there, there's a point where they mention that there's no way Empress Jingu could have done it without being an enlightened woman. So she's obviously an enlightened woman, right? Um, so I guess that at least shows us that even though there are so many misogynistic discourses, there is some tension around them and, um, and some possible alternate interpretations, if not for all women, at least for some. So, yeah, so I think I'll end there and open it up to questions from everyone, if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. I am actually going to pass on the microphone to one of our students.